find the Gnostic myths to be bizarre, while others find them to be blasphemous, and still others find them to be exhilarating and inspiring. Well, they made us curious. By the way, we are full of questions that we could never get answered. You know, things like, why is the world we live in so full of senseless suffering? What can we do to overcome the misery and put our lives into something meaningful? Is this world where we really belong? Or is this despair just a constant background? Do we really belong somewhere else? Why does this world suck? Why is life so hard? The Gnostics say that an imperfect demiurge created an imperfect world. And that seems to explain a lot concerning the suckage of this world. And the Gnostics identified this imperfect demiurge with the God of the Old Testament. And they said that he wanted to keep humans in a state of ignorance in a material world and punish their attempts to achieve knowledge and gain insight. Now it would seem obvious to me at least that the Holy Spirit is attempting to renew our minds with this forever hidden information. I did always hear that the truth will prevail. Now do you suppose the old ways of living and looking at things have passed away? And it's time for a positive change? The religion we were taught as kids hasn't changed any of the suffering from hostility. And I'm sure it's because of who's still in charge. The God of this world has us enslaved into bondage. Now it could be worse, however because Jesus set us free from the transgression of his law. And the way things are in this world, it leaves us just wanting to go home. Or better still, wouldn't it be nice if he'd just completely go away? You do understand we're calling Yahweh the God of this world. He is our bipolar adversary, it would seem. The old answers we got in our rebuttals only got doubling down of old beliefs. And that put us into hostile positions. And this is exactly why so many these days are looking for answers elsewhere. We certainly didn't get answers that rang true for many of those well-minded people who continue to defend and teach the old narrative. The metaphors of yesterday, along with a lifetime of literalism, just doesn't ring true to many of us these days. So an imperfect demiurge created an imperfect world. And the Gnostics identified this imperfect demiurge with the God of the Old Testament. No, we certainly speak bad against the old T. And actually, we're only bad-mouthing the God of the Old Testament. Because there are portions of the Old Testament, especially those written by the Yahweh-only party, that can't be from the loving Father of Jesus. The composite book was written by many authors over many centuries, so... There are several views being expressed. And the truth is, we recognize portions of the Old Testament as having indeed a spirit-inspired message. (laughs) One such story that rings true, knowing the Gnostic stories, is about the mysterious figure that appears very early in Genesis, and only in a few verses. Seems there's a Canaanite priest, Melchizedek, appears to Abraham and makes mention of El Elyon, God Most High. Melchizedek breaks bread and wine with Abraham, who ties to El Elyon. No blood sacrifice. Melchizedek is unique in that he is the only character in Genesis who is not mentioned with a genealogy. It's not entirely clear what Melchizedek is, but it's clear that he represents Christ. Think about it. He breaks bread and wine and then simply advises Abraham to follow God Most High. Melchizedek, just like Jesus, says worship God and reveals his name. Both agree it's El Elyon, the God Most High. What we can be sure of from this is that New Testament God who Jesus speaks of is called God, or El Elyon, and he is without equal. There is no mention of Yahweh, the Lord of Angels, or the Lord. Remember when John the Baptist was born in Luke 1, it is said of him, and you, my son, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him. 
And when Mary became aware she was to have child, also from Luke 1, this time referring to Jesus, He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And a couple of psalms from the Old Testament say some inspiring stuff as well. Psalm 82 says, You are gods, and all of you are sons of the Most High. Psalm 57 says, I will cry to God Most High, to God who accomplishes all things for me. This one jumps out too. Psalm 91, 1. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. This one is doubly intriguing. House of the Most High in the shadow of the Almighty. Remember the name El Shaddai was translated as Almighty and El Shaddai has been translated as the God with breasts. So the verse seems to be saying dwell in God's house along with the missus. <laughs> now this is our starting point for truth. We realize we're mixing Gnosticism and Christianity, but the God Most High sounds like the Invisible Father of the Gnostics and sounds closer to the loving, compassionate Father that Jesus Christ was representing. So as I said, it seems obvious that the Holy Spirit is renewing our minds. Knowing the difference between the Demiurge and the real Father might even get us off this wheel of life and having to try again. So these days, some of us see God the Father as only good, and only light, and only love. Not fearful, jealous, wrathful, and deceiving. Let's finish with something else from the Old Testament. When the Most High, El Elyon, apportioned the nations as an inheritance, when he divided up humankind, he established the borders of the peoples, according to the number of the sons of God. But Yahweh's portion is his people. Israel is the lot of his inheritance. And the best thing about this new belief, we don't have to worship the concept of a tribal deity that only inherited a nation from the father El Elyon. 